why? Why is the selling price? All we said, the response variable. So two variables, and then we will just apply this form. And finally, consider the conclusion coefficient is 0 0.90059. So that is our value. OK, so what was that? Our value is more closer to 1. They have stronger relationship, strong linear relationship. So now we can point 0.9. This point 0.9 is also not strong, but we can say yes. If they have the strong relationship, or more relationship between the house size and house price. So that was the first quotient answer. The interpretation is this one. So linear coefficient coefficient that is a strong coefficient between the house size and the house selling price. That's our R value. So you just need to know how to solve this problem. There are a lot of calculations, not You just you just need a calculator. And be careful with calculator was perfect. Because you have a lot of calculations. If I ask coefficient coefficient problems. Okay. So one data set, first questions. We just learned what is the first question. What is the next question? Next question is compute the least squares regression line. Does anyone remember? What was the definition last last question? Cat equal P naught plus P one X. So that is our equation of least square regression line. That's what we want to calculate. So what is P naught? P naught Y intercept. And what is P one? P1 is a slope. Okay. So now the question is okay, if I just calculate B0 and B1, then we are done. Okay. Then what is the formula for slope and what is the formula for y intercept? Okay. So the formula for B1 we call SXY and SXX. So what is that SXY? That is the formula. More ex expansion of this formula and then also the denomination. So what is x? x is house size. What is y? y is the house selling price. Okay. So, so that's what we got. And then the alpha value and the test statistics, so that's the test statistics formula T, B1, we don't even want to slope, is E divided by S, X, X, X. And then that's the test statistics formula. And how we calculate every single step? I wrote down very good. Every single step. Guys, how are you guys doing today? So as you can see, this is another two-part vlog, Tuesday and Wednesday. So of course I had to start the day off with some stats, and now I'm here at pre-calc. So you can see why there. Are, so there are a little bit more people than normal because we have a test, and it's before finals week. So yeah, stressful. Yes. Am I gonna die? Hopefully not. Um. So wish me luck, you guys. <laughs> You guys can currently see I wrapped up the math in the pre-calc exam. That was pretty good. And so now I'm having a breakfast burrito you know, and a protein shake to get me started for the day. And uh, so what? I have an exam to do for my chem lab, which is so I'm not wearing the lab coat, as you know, because no more labs, which is sad. <clears throat> but hey. It just goes to show that I'm almost done with this semester and my first year. So I'm really looking forward to that overall, so. Uh, the chem lab lecture, uh, not the chem lab lecture. <laughs> what do I say? I finished up the chem lab exam. It was actually a final I was taking. It was like 20 questions. It seemed, it was pretty easy enough. I managed to get through it. So now we're gonna head into the bio lecture. And yeah, and like you guys know, I can't re really record in there, so I'll try to record my notes if I can, so wish me luck. Normal freezing point would be at one atmosphere. 
here on this line, you drop it down, and you'll be able to see the freezing point of just the solvent on its own. Well, because we have pressure lower, now that comes a lot sooner. As you can see, I'm outside. I finished my chem lecture. Just got just finished having my pretty long four-hour break because I didn't have recitation today. I had my last recitation class last week, which is sad. But also, I get more time to myself, so that's a plus, right? So I finished my break, did a little bit of homework for chem. So now what else? Oh yeah, heading over to the bio lecture, so. And that's the last class of the day, so. Am I happy? Yeah. So it looks like they've got like a couple of music players over here. That's really cool. Awesome. And as you can see, I'm at the bio lecture now. And sadly, I'm pretty sure this is gonna be the last bio lecture for the semester and for the year, so. That's a little bit sad, but eh. I mean, at least I do get a bit of a break from this stuff anyway, so I guess good, but also bittersweet, so. <laughs> Woo! So, yeah, that's the end of the Kahoot. We did a little Kahoot. This is my high score for this Kahoot. Uh, I didn't get first place, obviously, but I'm just happy that I actually got most of the answers right. So I'm happy about that. Anyway, I want. Oh. Oh, everyone's debating about GMOs. Like a genetic diversity. Corn, right? If you have cornflakes that probably contain GMO corn, 
but there's there so far have not been found to be any negative effects. Um, so in some cases you could take like this traditionally bred corn is vulnerable to this this caterpillar, and this you know, caterpillar can just destroy the corn crop. But then with the GMO technology, you could put the BT gene, which produces something that's basically toxic to the caterpillars, in the corn, and then it becomes and then, then you don't know, have so many um, and, you know, pests eating your corn. The manipulation technique is a lot easier to use than you can use to modify genomes. And quite a few researchers here, it's part of their toolkit. If you're interested in this, you can get in on this. And people like this guy is very famous, uh, retired professor Charles Arnson, an ASU, kind of my boss, and for more. Um, they use these techniques all the time to try to, you know, to achieve scientific goals. Um, and I, I think that GMOs can be a useful addition to the modern toolkit of scientific agriculture. Like, I feel like, let's put it all on the table, let's use every tool at our disposal, that's my opinion. But you, could, you of course, can disagree. Um, uh, but, at the same time, uh, while I'm in favor of GMOs, I, we also should not neglect the biodiversity of crops our ancestors produced. Right? So if our ancestors have been growing corn, our ancestors have been growing wheat, and they've grown all these plants for thousands of years, and there's all these old varieties that have useful genes that could be beneficial in a, in a hotter or drier climate or wetter climate. And even, even with cattle breeds, you know, some of these cattle, somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast. So this metaphor of the wet queen has been adopted by evolutionary biologists to think about, you know, you know like getting ahead or surviving in nature. You know, so like. In nature, the world doesn't stand still, right? And so you, you know, we did these deep dives. You guys read about the uh, super weeds. You guys remember that deep dive earlier in the semester? Like, the world does not stand still. You start using an herbicide or a pesticide or a plant on your crop, the world is not going to stand still. Natural selection is going to happen. And so we are always fighting that. So there's, it's always a temporary advantage in corn. When corn was had a Roundup resistant gene put into it, you know, genetically, then you spray the field with Roundup, it would kill everything else, only the corn would survive. But now evolution is happening, right? And a lot of um, so yes. So how can we meet the, the, the needs of a growing population? Some people argue for vegetarianism. It would require less land, and the same number of people. There's a lot of benefits to it. I have submit to the economy. I'm not a vegetarian. You know, I had steak for lunch, you know, so it's a little, little hypocritical. But the arguments are, they make sense to me. And I'm kind of heading, I think I'm kind of heading that way, you know. Um, biofuels, biofuels, there was a lot of hope that biofuels would be a good thing. Biofuels have been a total loss, I think. They're mostly a total loss. Like, it takes so much, often you're using as much gas as you need, and you have to use all this fertilizer to grow, to make corn-based ethanol. To me, a lot of biofuels are a total rip-off. It's just a scam that's just, we should be using that land to grow real crops or make, protect biodiversity, you know. Um, a few of these, like, if you look at some of them, like in, like, switchgrass is a little bit better. So you, know, you look here at some of the percent of existing cropland to produce enough fuel to half. So you have to use, like, for corn, you have to use, uh, like, 200% of our current land to grow corn to make, produce half the gasoline that we use. It's nuts. It's totally nuts. Um, and this, in places like Iowa, this is like, because it became so profitable to do this, um, all the land was that they could grow corn and they grow and grow corn everywhere. And of course, they grew the like, insect biodiversity. So cool. to me, biofuels, I don't think for the most part that's uh, another a part of the solution. Feel free to disagree with me. Anybody have any other thoughts on biofuels? I'm just curious to what you guys think. Raise your hand or stretching. I think he's stretching. That's the best idea. I'm talking too much. Okay. He's just stretching. Okay. Um, so, yeah, sustainable future for agriculture requires creativity, ingenious engineers, wise citizens. It's a mix of things, right? That's why, you know, we need to be good citizens, you know. You know. Uh, how should we protect biodiversity? Okay, let's let's say this question. We're almost there. Uh, how should we protect biodiversity? What do you guys think? I distinctly remember. The windshield would be just covered with dead insects. You know, like you have to stop at the gas station every time you fill up and like clean your windshield because there'd be just flats everywhere. And I, 
I don't see that happening anymore. A lot of people report this. Like, you don't see that on your windshield. So the windshield wiper, it's like the windshield wiper biodiversity survey. And they've done surveys in many places, and the insect biodiversity in many places is plummeting. And of course, then, somber biodiversity, because somebody's eating the insects, right? So even this is even affecting the insects right now. Uh, so, Theo Wilson, who's died earlier this year, he suggested the half bird, like the idea that half the earth should be set aside for nature. Um, and this is a noble vision, but probably not feasible. The Biden administration came up with a 30 by 30 plan, which is that, so in 2020, about 12%, that's pretty good. It's pretty good, actually, compared to like European countries. 12% is protected, but the idea is to increase it to 30%. Um, so it's a very ambitious goal, but um, the, it's been stymied, you know, Biden's whole domestic agenda has been stymied, it hasn't been as successful in getting some of these things enacted. So this has gotten pushed back, uh, and so that I'm not sure what the status of it is, how successful it is. Um, but, you know, because of course landowners, farmers are saying, that's our land you're talking about, and so how do we get there? That's the question, right? Um, okay, listen. So that's the final exam. And that was the bio lecture. So as you guys can see, that's pretty much some info for the final exam next week. So wish me luck, guys. I cannot believe this is the last bio le lecture of the semester, the last official bio lecture. So with that, so... It looks like that's going to be it for for today's video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys did enjoy. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure to like it and subscribe if you want to keep seeing more videos from me. Also, as always, if you guys are interested in seeing more content that is not on my YouTube channel, then please do go to the link down below in the description so you can check out my social media if you want to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, or TikTok. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye!